We're continuing our discussion on mycoplasma bovis with the experts from Pfizer Animal Health. Dr. Scruggs, now is mycoplasma bovis something that is only limited to Colorado and Iowa, or is this a nationwide kind of a problem? No, it's a nationwide problem, and I, I think um, as far as geographic distribution, um, it probably has more to do with how we market cattle in certain areas mm. of the country, because the more we commingle cattle, uh, the smaller ranches that are pooling cattle together in, in different marketing systems, that, that tends to increase our incidence. So absolutely it's a nationwide, if not a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, so it, it doesn't have a geographic boundaries. So, so what are the uh, impacts to the beef industry at large of this pathogen? Well, I mean, a lot of times people are asking about financial impacts, and that's a, that's a very difficult question to answer because it's hard to tease out what fractional contribution mycoplasma bovis makes versus a lot of our other bacteria and viruses. But I'd rather frame it in a different way. Okay. Is, uh, is, is regardless of what the overall incidence is, uh, you can drown to death in a river that's only average depth of three feet. And when you're dealing with an operation that's having a mycoplasma blow up and they're treating a high percentage of the cattle, they're getting very poor treatment responses, lots of non-responders and lots of chronics, they don't care what the nationwide incidence is. Yeah. They know that they're, that they're in one of the deep holes of that river right then and there. And, and to me, that's where we see the most uh, impact is in individual operations that have run aground with a particularly severe problem that's built up over weeks and months. Gotcha. Dr. Blood, specifically, can you talk to us about how this disease is spread and, and, and what some of the things are that we as producers can do to prevent it? Well, like many of the uh, respiratory pathogens we deal with, it's, it's animal to animal contact. It spreads it from animals. And with, in the case of mycoplasma, it doesn't take long for one of those carriers to infect everybody in the pen. Um, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on in, in our feed yards and our ranch are, and, and Ryan alluded to it a few minutes ago, was we don't have a good vaccine for mycoplasma in, in the feed yard or the ranch level, so we focus on doing everything else right to hopefully have that animal in good shape to, if he does get infected, to be able to, to uh, fight that organism off better. And, um, um, you know, that would include limiting the co-mingling as much as we can. Sometimes that's absolutely impossible, impos but it is something we try to do as much as we can. Uh, focus on doing a good job of getting our good vaccines to the other pathogens that we have available to us, getting those used in a timely manner. And just a typical preconditioning type, taking care of the animal, keeping the pathogen load down as much as we can. Gotcha. What would you add, Dr. Scott? Well, that's an, that's an interesting question, an interesting topic. It surprised most people to learn that when a group of feeder cattle hit the feed yard, generally less than 5% of them are infected with mycoplasma bovis. It's a very low percentage, closer to 2% most studies show. Mm. But by 21 days on feed, we're up to about 75 to 80% of those cattle are infected. Wow. So it blows through them pretty quickly, just like what Dr. Blood uh, alluded to. And the other thing we've noticed in some emerging studies is, is that when cattle are infected with more than one bacteria, the treatment response rate tends to go down about 10 to 15 percentage points. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you superimpose mycoplasma bovis infection with two or more bacteria, mm. you get into a poor response situation. That's one of the main reasons I think why we see a, a poor response with mycoplasma bovis than we do with other uh, organisms. Gotcha. Jim, as somebody who's had to deal with this problem up close and, and personal, uh, what would you tell us from your war stories that you'd want other producers to know? Well, this can be a very costly and devastating disease, and if, if you're not using the Draxin as a mass treatment on arrival, use it as your first line of defense. Uh, we've, we, we found that it made such a dramatic difference in, in our right off the bat that our death loss we're running less than a half a percent wow and uh, it's actually made starting calves fun again you know <laughs> that and that's and that's tough that is tough <laughs> that is tough Ryan what would you tell us from your lessons well I think the biggest thing is uh, get with your local veterinarian and come up with a good vaccination program and come up with your first protocol of how you're going to treat, what you're going to do, what your main line of defense is, and uh, trust in Draxin because it will work. And the biggest thing is I felt like our cowboys and myself, 
When we did use Draxin, we might be over medicating cattle because on day five, day four, day six, we don't maybe see that big uh, turnaround. Uh, and so we try to see where the animal is and, and, and where the pin is, is on the average. And if that animal's after he's had Draxin, because Draxin's a 14 day medication. Gotcha. And so if you jump in there too soon, I feel like, you know, be aware of that. Maybe don't try to get that other antibiotic in there unless that animal is less than where his average was. You know, if he looks worse, he probably needs something else to go with it. But that's been our biggest deal. Uh, Money-wise, uh, a lot of people think that Draxin and other antibiotics are too high, but treat a calf three or four times and you'll spend it and it's well worth it. And when you get your clothes out in the end and performance and keeping that mycoplasma under control when you get your clothes out at the end, uh, it'll be a huge return on your investment. Gotcha. Dr. Blood, uh, for folks who think they may have a mycoplasma bovis problem, uh, what resources do they have available? Your first resource probably is your veterinarian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we see a situation where we're seeing some of those infected ears, mm -hmm. the ear down, some poor response to respiratory treatment, some of those swollen up, swoll swollen joints that aren't responding to therapy, then that's a good good indicator you have some mycoplasma going on. So your your veterinarian, uh, it would be a good resource of a person to get in there and do some diagnostics in those animals. There's some things we can do on live animal and even on those more chronic animals that are that we can euthanize, then uh, doing a full post-mortem on them is a, is a good, good source of information for what's going on in that herd. Gotcha. Dr. Scruggs, any other resources we should consider? Well, I'll echo, uh, get with your veterinarian and also the diagnostic laboratory resources. That's, that's, a, that's a treasure we have in this country. Mm -hmm. Some very good diagnostic labs. But I, but I caution you, just running out there with a the swab and finding mycoplasma doesn't mean that's causing you a problem. Gotcha. That's why the veterinarian is so important in helping you pull together the diagnostic information and fit it together with what you're seeing clinically to, 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 to make sure you're addressing the right problems with the right things. Well, this has been a very, very insightful discussion and I appreciate your personal experiences uh, in your own operations.